Welcome to Puerto Rico, Nick. Thank you. It's incredible to be here. Your first San Juan session? I'm feeling the island vibes, the island life. Yeah, how, yeah. how was your island travel yesterday? Oh, it was a, a flight fiasco, if you will. Yeah. It's a disaster, but I made it here. Well, we missed you at dinner, but uh, you'll be around for the festivities this evening. Thank you. Looking forward to it. So, you know, I think what I wanted to talk about today in general is I'm dealing with the private markets and I deal with fluctuations and valuations mm -hmm. over time. And, you know, one of the biggest questions folks have when they're thinking about selling their business is, you know, on the one hand, they worry about the fundamentals of their company. Like, mm -hmm. what's my cash flow and my revenue? How big is it? But I think another important consideration is what are the broader equity markets doing from a valuation perspective, right? If mm -hmm. a lawn care business is selling at five times EBITDA versus a lawn care business selling at 15 times EBITDA, that makes a massive difference in what people walk away with. But this is certainly not a, a situation um, solely for the private capital markets. Obviously, the public capital markets go through this. So I wanted to talk about returns from a historical perspective. And I could think of no better person to chat with about that than you. Yeah, yeah. I think that it's definitely easy for folks that are running their business to focus on things they can control, as you mentioned, revenue, cash flows, et cetera. And then you hear about transactions largely from all the great information that you provide. Uh -huh. But I do think taking a step back, you know, really a big step back and not just thinking about that micro area of home services or pest control, but broader markets in general, mm -hmm. both from a valuation perspective and a return perspective. Because look, at the end of the day, if private equity is buying a lot of pest control businesses, ultimately they need to exit. And so that broader perspective and that broader market environment is mm -hmm. going to impact the valuation. Absolutely. Right? And so when we think about what's transpired over time, okay, one thing I like to tell you know, my client partners is that three out of the last nine decades, equities have returned zero relative to cash, right? So 33% of the time, you, know, you invest in stocks, US stocks at the beginning of the decade, at the end of that decade, you would have been better off investing in cash, which to me, when I ran the data, which I run all my data, and that was a surprising yeah. statistic, okay? And that was the 1930s, the 1970s, and from 2000 to 2010, okay? And those decades, I think, really can also be analyzed in thinking about how did valuation change across those decades? Because, you know, one thing you've talked about a lot within pest control is that multiples have gone from let's say you tell me five to six times EBITDA, mm -hmm. one time sales mm -hmm. 25 years ago, right? Yeah. To now three to five times sales and you know, Correct. 14 to 20 times EBITDA. Exactly. Okay. And so let's look back at the 1970s, one of these lost decades, if you will, relative to cash. So in the 1970s, the price to earnings ratio started off the 1970s at 20 times earnings. Okay, which was essentially equivalent to- Are you talking about like the S&P? Yeah, the S&P yeah. 500, right? Yep. So these are, you know, much lower risk enterprises relative to a micro cap, small pest control or home services business. Correct. Okay. And so at 20 times earnings, that's about equivalent to, let's call it 14 times EV to EBITDA or yep. EBITDA multiple. Yep. However, throughout that decade, when returns languished, largely due to higher interest rates and inflation, the PE multiple oscillated then between six times PE, right, which is equivalent to four times EBITDA, mm -hmm. um, to about you know fifteen times PE, or let's call it, or about fourteen times PE, so about a ten times EBITDA multiple. Yep. So you're talking about a huge change from fourteen times EBITDA to four to ten times EBITDA. Yep. Right, and that's again, these are the largest companies in the U.S. And there was a similar experience in the 2000s where the decade started off even more overvalued at 26 times earnings and then oscillated, you know, on a EBITDA basis between, you know, around like eight to 14 times again. Okay. So big changes in valuation in the biggest and most profitable and lowest risk companies in the world. And here you're looking at things from a broad-based perspective. I think, you know, when I think about the late 90s, I started my career in industrial M&A. Okay. And then I 
around 2000, I moved into, I, I moved out to California. I worked in the tech space. And so when I was doing industrial stuff, you know, you have like John Deere, Case New Holland, all these old school capital goods businesses. Mm -hmm. None of them were trading in double digits, right? All yeah. of these companies were like five, six, seven, eight times mm -hmm. EBITDA, whereas the tech companies weren't even producing cash flow. So EBITDA multiples were not meaningful. They were trading like 40 times revenue. But it just goes to show that even within the equity markets, when people are allocating capital to the narratives and what's hot, yeah, it was pulling capital from companies manufacturing cars and tractors exactly. and logistics it's, companies. Exactly. You had yeah. wide dispersion yes. at that turn of the century point that you're talking Correct. about. Yeah. And so um, it's also, I think, instructive to look at those decades. And this is more an investment topic, not yeah. necessarily an M&A pest control or home services topic. But I think it is instructive during those lost decades to understand what did do well, because, you know, having exposure, even if it's a little bit of exposure to those other asset classes can really protect clients from having the lost decades of no returns. Because I, I don't know about you, but the last thing I want to see is a pest control owner work for 20, 30 years, get a big pile of cash and then earn zero return mm. for 10 years. That's just not a satisfactory result, even though most would say, oh, you know, stocks for the long run, stay the course yep. and everything's going to work out. I mean, 10 years with no return, like, that's absurd. Yeah, I, mean, I also think about it, like from my own personal perspective, you know, as transaction multiples have gone up in home services, when you look across everything from gutter to roofing to lawn care to pest control, mm -hmm. you know, we've had, uh, and there's a variety of reasons for that, right? The extremely low yield environment has caused folks to want to focus on consolidations, right? You got the private equity firms focusing on consolidations. Of course, in home services, you have COVID, which is a big boom. Yeah. But you know, when I think about it, it's like, okay, transaction multiples go up, so people are eyeing huge exits. And it's caused people to, private business owners to allocate more capital to their businesses, because it makes sense, right? Like if yeah. I can take a dollar and invest it in my lawn care business, and ultimately turn that one dollar into multiples of that, why wouldn't I do that? Absolutely. But I, I think the big concern that I have and what I've seen over the last 10 years is people are kind of like going all in. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm getting old, I'm not that old yet. I've only been at this 20 years, but mm -hmm. I think about 15 years ago, a lot of business owners would say, okay, I'm growing a pest control company, I'm growing a guttering business, I'm going to kick off dividends, yeah. I'm going to reinvest some of that cash flow back into the business and grow it, mm -hmm. but I'm also going to take that money out, I'm going to buy equities, I'm going to buy fixed income, I'm going to buy rental properties. And so they're diversifying their portfolio. Whereas in recent years now, it seems to me that when I talk to clients, they're eyeing this massive exit, which yeah. is causing them to be more concentrated in their portfolio, which is the one asset they have, which is mm -hmm. their home service business. Yeah. And I think for a lot of folks, you know, we've got a lot of people down in Puerto Rico this weekend. You're going to spend some time with a lot of folks that this has worked out brilliantly for, right? Yes. It, it was the best thing they could have done. But mm -hmm. I have to imagine at some point, it's going to end up being a pretty big mistake. Mm -hmm. it, it could. I mean, look, I have conflicting feelings about what you're talking about. Or not necessarily feelings, but, yeah. you know, when I think about it analytically, I have conflicting thoughts. Okay, let's talk Let about that. Let me explain. So the first aspect is that that has worked. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think of it like on a more even analytical basis of if you are generating a good incremental return on that dollar of capital mm -hmm. reinvested back into your business and you're actually measuring it, which mm -hmm. oftentimes you're not yep. doesn't happen. Yep. Right. But if you're you know putting money back into marketing or if you're opening a new branch location and you're measuring that incremental return on that capital and it's good. Right. And you think it's good on a risk adjusted basis even where it's like okay i got a 30 percent return on that and you know what like we already had customers in that area we'll be able to ramp up route density in that area and increase profitability and so we think that's a prudent investment with a good return on capital the problem is it doesn't get measured and then you do further increase concentration of your risk and i get it because when you control a business it doesn't feel risky mm -hmm. right but to think that a pest control operation is less risky than, let's say, 
Microsoft, right? Which by the way, Microsoft has gone from 74 times earnings in 2000 to 10 times earnings yep. between 2010 to 2012. And lo and behold, now it's back to 30 times earnings in terms of valuation multiples. Yep. Just to provide that mm -hmm. contrast again of how far things can, can vary and how wide the range can be. So getting back to the pest control example, I say I have mixed thoughts about it because then the last thing I wanna do as a you know, financial advisor, investment advisor for these folks is to say like, oh no, you gotta give me all that money. Let me manage it uh -huh. and then I can make money. But, and so there is that like self-serving part uh -huh. that I always point out to people. But I do think it Yeah, I it go does every, make, every week I ask my barber if I need a haircut and I'll look at me, right? Like I yeah. just gotta quit asking the guy. Yeah, so I try to make it more of an analytical exercise. We're like, okay, start measuring your incremental return on investment yeah. and whether or not you are getting a good return. Yeah. And then there is a point where it's like, okay, you don't have to put all of your incremental cash flow or your free cash flow that's coming out to the out of the business into other broad market investments. But there is a cushion that I do think like prudently Agreed. people should have. Because like at the end of the day, shit happens, right? So that those are some of my thoughts on it. What do you think about the best way? I, I have some thoughts about this, but you know, if you were sitting down talking to an owner about measuring the return on those dollars invested in the business, how would you suggest they do that? The way, I mean, look, I've studied a lot of businesses over, over time as a public markets investor for 20 years. And so the way I think about incremental returns on capital is like, if you're like, let's say we could go to, we could go to marketing spend, uh -huh. for instance, right? Like customer acquisition costs. Uh -huh. And then, so measuring actually what your true customer acquisition cost or CAC is, yep. and then trying to determine what the NPV of any given customer is, uh -huh. right? And there's a lot of calculations, yeah. as you know, in order to get that get that number. I was just on a Ask Me Anything call with Fat Pat the other day for Fraction Clients, and that's what we spent a good chunk of the, the call on, is actually saying, okay, how do you measure your customer acquisition cost? Yeah. How do you determine, because most people don't, don't do this, right? Right. So, And it's, I mean, for a, a business, a recurring revenue customer facing business like this, that's that's a key measurement, right? Is really understanding the net present value of each customer, then you know how much you can actually spend to acquire those customers and still generate a good return, mm -hmm. right? And I think that would also apply to actually more of a, um, let's call it a physical expansion of the business or a physical investment. I realize it's, it's capital light and yep. you can take on a new lease or whatnot in a new jurisdiction, yep. but you need to measure like, okay, in order to do that, you're going to have a period of time where that branch location is not going to be as high as your profitability of your existing location. Mm -hmm. So how much capital are you deploying into that opportunity? What's the ramp, modeling out the ramp of profitability? And then over, let's say, a three to five to seven year period, mm -hmm. figuring out what the run rate profitability is or cash flow is of that branch location relative to what that investment was mm -hmm. in order to get it up to speed. Okay. And then, you know, measuring a return, right? It's like profit over investment. And then you can determine like, you know what, that was a worthwhile investment. I earned uh, you know, 15, 20% incremental return okay, on that, on that investment of that branch location, for instance. Does that make sense to you? It makes, I mean, it's exactly the way that I look at it. Yeah. We have a lot of clients mm -hmm. who actually should not be investing money in their business because their business is actually destroying value. It's not, it, the, the returns are not in excess of the cost of capital of the business. And so right. it's actually a value destroying exercise. And I would say that that's probably at least half of the home service businesses out there, mm -hmm. maybe 70% of them mm -hmm. are actually destroying capital. And so it comes down to, you know, I always tell people that if you really want to make a lot of money and you want to get sophisticated about what you're doing in your life, you have to understand if your business is actually destroying capital or not. Yeah. Um, and then you have to weigh that decision relative to your other options. Mm -hmm. So you might be better off, you know, it's like you've got an extra half a million dollars and some guys are like, oh, I just want to ramp up marketing and just kill it. Are you better off investing that 500K with yourself? Or are yeah. you better off taking that 500K and buying an asset that's currently undervalued? Mm -hmm. 
So it's a, good, it's a good point. Because it's almost like it, it actually goes against the theory of capital preservation to invest money in a business that's actually destroying, <laughs> effectively destroying. Well, I mean, money. yeah, like let's like you take can, take the example of like, oh, let's let's uh, go out and spend a bunch of money trying to acquire new customers when you're acquiring more yep. customers for far more than your NPV per customer is, right? And, and it's it's not an easy task because on its surface, it actually looks like, okay, I'm investing money and I'm actually growing my business. That's the illusion, right? Right. Yeah, because you are growing. You know, the other thing is like, when we think about, you know, I think you and I will probably chat about the inflationary environment um, while we're down here, here, here in PR, but you know, one of the biggest issues now is like, nominal growth versus real growth. Um, and when you look at a company and, you know, guys are, you know, I just sat down last week, we had our internal Potomac call and we go through our clients and status and, you know, we have these conversations and, mm -hmm. you know, I had a conversation with a client who's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm killing it. I, um, you know, I raised my prices 8% across the, or 10% across the board and like, over the last 12 months, we grew 8%. I'm just mm -hmm. like, I didn't need the calculator to say, well, wait a second, if you've increased all your prices by 10% and your annual growth rate is 8%, yeah. do you not see a problem with that? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we've lived in an era where we've had such low inflation for so long, people never thought about real versus nominal. Mm -hmm. And like, if you talked about a growth rate of a business and you said 10%, well, okay, we had one, one and a quarter percent inflation, maybe 2%, but at the end of the day, that was real. Right. Now it's like when you're raising your prices 10% per annum and you're not keeping up with inflation. So, I mean, where it really comes up too, and like, and this is that concept, I just love the term and I love the, the study behind it of the money illusion, right? Because that's effectively what you're describing. And this was this concept that this famous economist, at least like to finance nerds like, like me, came up with in the 1930s, which was, real versus nominal growth. Uh -huh. But then the question to ask that pest control owner is, how about your margins and your profits? So your prices went up 10, yep. your revenue went up eight, what did your cash flow do? Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if it was up two or flat, right? And this is that, that that's really the money illusion at work. Yeah. Because in nominal terms, especially on the top line, everything looks great. But guess what? You have your suppliers, you have labor, you have other costs that are also inflating, and that also inevitably impacts profitability. Nick, we started talking at the beginning of the discussion about returns over time and valuation multiples. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think is the most important takeaway for people to think about when they think about returns over time? Yeah. What I think is really important is to make sure everyone's taking a step back, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm talking about taking a step back to not just home services, pest control, but taking a step back to the broader financial markets because that obviously has an impact at the micro level of how valuation multiples are going to be impacted. Mm -hmm. And I think by looking over decades, which again is another step back, mm -hmm. not only to bigger companies and broader markets, but also over longer periods of time to understand that there is massive fluctuations in valuation multiples, EBITDA multiples, price to earnings multiples, over decades, and that clearly impacts equity returns. But you know, going forward, we could see big changes in pest control multiples as well. And it's it's not a prediction. And I, I mean, I'm a, I obviously want pest control multiples as yeah. do you yeah. to stay where they are. And that might happen because we could see that there has been a re-rating of pest control multiples. But I just you know, as a as someone who likes to manage risk, I think it's important for people to have that broader perspective that over long periods of time, multiples do change. You know, I mean, what you just said about, you know, about how the broader capital markets impact valuations at the micro level, like the family business owner level, I mean, it's something that I've been talking about for years yeah. and years and years. And, you know, at its very core, you know, you ask somebody, a business owner, what's their, you know, what's your net worth all in? And somebody will say, well, you know, I'm worth 20 million bucks because mm -hmm. my pest control business is worth 15 million and I've got 5 million in real estate, cash, marketable securities. Your net worth is really $20 million. Your net worth is really the cash flow that that business is generating plus the value of those other assets you have 
the value of that business is really what the market's valuing at it right now immediately. Yes. And so all you have is that stream of cash flow. Mm -hmm. The market, it's far more dynamic now today than it ever has been. You know, 15 years ago, all of these home services businesses, the market's were pretty sleepy. Valuation multiples didn't change much. But nowadays, I mean, with the consolidation wave, with yield issues, mm -hmm. rising yields, we've got all sorts of things going on. And, you know, these things can change month over month, quarter over quarter. Mm -hmm. And I always caution people. I mean, we have seen right now today, if I look back to 2021, when everything was flying off the shelf, valuations yeah. hit all time highs. You have a certain subsection of the market where valuations have remained elevated, extremely elevated, but others mm -hmm. have rolled off, especially for some of these smaller businesses. And, you know, I, I was talking on Fat Pets asked me anything call the other day. And one of the things that I mentioned is, you know, we had a very small client, our smallest client that we took out to market last year and it went no bid. No one wanted it, hmm. no one bid on it. We took it out again this year and we had one bid. Hmm. Now the bid actually ended up, you know, when we ran an, a quasi auction. And of course the acquirers don't know who else is involved. Mm -hmm. The guy got a blockbuster price for it, but at the end of the day, there was just one bidder. Um, I've seen situations where we've gone no bid, and then a year later, we have 15 bids. Mm -hmm. And so the market does change rapidly. And I, I, I do think people need to take into consideration the broader, you know, worry about the fundamentals of your business. Yeah. That's important. Mm -hmm. But don't only just worry about the fundamentals of your business when you're planning an exit. Because like you said, People think at the end of the day, if they're in control of it, it's relatively low risk. And I agree with that to a certain degree from the fundamental perspective. But in my mind, the calculus for valuation is it's probably like 25% fundamentals and then 75% of what's going on out in the capital markets. Yeah, it is. And as you're talking, it actually reminds me of one of my favorite quotes as it relates to what you and I do. And you'll, you can appreciate this because I'm going back in history a bit here, but Seneca, the Stoic Roman philosopher and leader or whatnot has a great quote about this net worth dynamic, in my opinion, which is the pain of losing your fortune is far worse than the pleasure of making more money. Uh -huh. Okay, and I think that encapsulates some of this dynamic about multiples, risk, and how that relates to someone's life. Absolutely it does. Yeah, so cool. Thanks for cool. having me down here in Puerto Thanks Rico. Thanks for coming down, brother. Yeah, it's great down here. Cool. All right.